I am here. I'm just waiting for. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, so I'm just moving the location. So bear with me one second, yes. and then we will start our discussion. Um, we'll all we'll do first of all say Mangala Charin to receive the um, the blessings of the Guru Parampara, and then we'll go from there to read. Yeah, some very interesting and instructive verses from the Bhagavatam regarding also amongst many different things it will also regard behavior okay so let's check that my camera's working can you see me no Prabhuji we can't see you your screen is very um, dark no, I don't. I'm not sure why that's the case let me just see if I can yeah now you can. now we can see you Perfect. Okay, so actually we'll just say our respects to Krishna first. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Okay, so having offered respects to the Lord and Srimad Bhagavatam. So this verse in purport is from the pastime of Narada Muni. So I'll read the Sanskrit, the translation, and then we will go from there. Yasya yadaiva vihitam satena sukha dukha yoho atmanam toshayam dehi tamasa param richati. Translation. One should try to keep himself satisfied in any condition of life, whether distress or happiness, which is offered by the supreme will. A person who endures in this way is able to cross over the darkness of nescience very easily. Purple by his divine grace, Shula AC, Bhaktivedanta Swami Shula Prabhupada, Shula Prabhupada Ki Jai. Material existence consists of pious and impious fruitive activities. As long as one is engaged in any kind of activity other than devotional service, it will result in the happiness and distress of this material world. When we enjoy life in so-called material happiness, it is to be understood that we are diminishing the resultant actions of our pious activities. And when we are put into suffering, it is to be understood that we are diminishing the resultant actions of our impious activities. Instead of being attached to the circumstantial happiness and distress resulting from pious or impious activities, if we want to get out of the clutches of this nescience, then whatever position we are put in, by the will of the Lord, we should accept. Thus, if we simply surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we shall get out of the clutches of this material existence. This is really, really significant verse and purple, and there's tremendous instruction for all of us. So we'll say Mangalacharyan, then we'll discuss, and then we'll open up for any questions you may have. Omegyana Timurandasya. Yananjana Shilakaya Chekshu Om Militamina Tasmai Shri Guru Vaina Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gada Mayam Dadati Swapadanti Kam Vande Ham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Guru and Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tomsajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahakana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Rade Vrindava Neshvari Vrishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchika Patrubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyeva Chapatita Nam Pava Nebhyo Vaishnava Ebhyo Namo Namaha. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunitya Nanda. Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Rinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. 
Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So, this, this verse is interesting for a number of reasons. Um, Srimati, I'm going to ask you to just go back one, one verse. So click on the previous and scroll up a bit. Okay. This verse is the advice that is being given by Narada Muni to Dhruva Maharaj. So to set the context, Dhruva Maharaj is a Kshatriya. He has a warrior nature. He's been insulted. He wanted to play on the lap of his father. His stepmother told him basically, you're not, you know, because you didn't come of my womb, you can't have that position, right? His brother Uttama was able to have that position. He wasn't. And feeling dejected, Dhruva leaves the assembly. He goes to his mum, his actual mother. Her name is Suniti. She admits to him, yep, your father favours this other queen, etc., etc. And he's given advice eventually, which is to go to the forest to find the Lord. Now, if you go back again to the next verse, please, Srimati. This advice is being given. 4833 by Narada Muni. And this advice is extremely important advice if we want to maintain our sanity while we're in this material world. There's a secret to the Shastra, right? And it's, it's, it's a secret which is not really appreciated. The secret to the Shastra is the ability to bring you in touch with reality. Our suffering is of two types. One type of suffering is because we're not in touch with the spiritual world. We're not in touch with Krishna. <laughs> but, but funnily enough, strangely enough, our other type of suffering is we're not even properly in touch with the material energy as well. There are three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Having a proper understanding of the material energy means that there's some sattva there. Because it's like this. If you know that the crocodile is a crocodile, you can avoid him. Your suffering occurs, our suffering occurs, when we think that the crocodile is some kind of, you know, is some nice creature, right? So we think the crocodile is, I don't know, let's see, what, what, like it is, is a puppy. So then you approach that crocodile like you would approach a puppy. And then you get viciously bitten and maybe even killed. So two types of suffering. Unfortunately, in Kali Yuga, our situation is so bad that we don't even understand the material reality, what to speak of going beyond it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a real source of our suffering. Now, let's go to this verse in particular. This verse is actually explaining, and then the purple, Prabhupada is really explaining something that it makes sense, but you wouldn't think of it if you didn't hear from Prabhupada. What is Prabhupada saying? about the material energy. He says, material existence consists of pious and impious fruitive activities. As long as one is engaged in any kind of activity other than devotional service, it will result in the happiness and distress of this material world. In, now, he goes on to say, when we enjoy life in so-called material happiness, it is to be understood that we are diminishing the resultant actions of our pious activities. Isn't that interesting? So if you look at it, for many of us, and definitely if we're just an, a, your average person in the world, we'll think, wow, 
I'm enjoying myself materially. Things are going really well. What Prabhupada is saying here is that every time we're having some good material situation, we're spending all of our pious material credits. Isn't that interesting? So someone's having a good time and they think, wow, let's be honest, most of the time when people are having a good time, they think it's going to be like this forever. I'm enjoying myself now. Life's good. Yeah, life's good. I don't need to think about this God and death and, you know, the future. No, I'm, I'm, I'm young. I've got energy. Everything's going well. Isn't it interesting what Prabhupada is saying? This is him explaining the reality of the material energy. It's so powerful that we may read it and it doesn't register. We don't really notice what's really being said. He's saying that every time you, you, you're having a good time materially, you're spending all of your pious credits. They're going, going, going more, going more. You've got less pious credits. The guy who has some good material situation, the lady who's got some good material situation, every time they have that, there's less and less material piety left. Prabhupada is also saying, okay, the same thing. And when we are put into suffering, it is to be understood that we are diminishing the resultant actions of our impious activities. That means when you're suffering, you're paying back the karmic debt. Right. So there's I, I've got 100 days of suffering that I'm meant to have. So every day that I'm suffering, it's running out. The impious credit, the impious karma is running out. It's being it's being burned off through the suffering. That means our karma is limited. The material piety, the material impiety, these things are limited. No? They burn off. The only type of piety that lasts is spiritual. It's a very powerful point. The only piety that stays with anyone is spiritual. Now, if you told, if you told people there's two things you can invest in. One type of investment, you can invest in it, but it will always run out eventually. The other type of investment, you can invest in it and you will get the benefit of that investment forever. It just, it just would not make sense to invest in something that's going to run out, that you know is going to run out. When you have the option, when we have the option to invest in something that will last forever. The investment that lasts forever is the investment in Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada, going back to this first statement, um, yeah, the first sentence in the purple, material existence consists of pious and impious fruitive activities. As long as one is engaged in any kind of activity other than devotional service, it will result in the happiness and distress of this material world. So what we've been given by Srila Prabhupada is an eternal investment. What Prabhupada is actually saying in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam, in his teachings, he's saying, look, it's not, it's, not, it's not a punishment. He's saying, look, you've only got a short period of life. Why spend your time, your precious time, doing something that's bound to leave you? Why not spend your time doing something which, funnily enough, this is very important also, will give you the same benefits as material piety and more. What do I mean that, by that? Okay, so three options. Option A, I can eat something impious. Okay, so I can eat flesh. I can drink alcohol. I can take something that's considered bad karma. That's option A. Option B, I can take something which, I can, which is more considered to be pious. Okay, so a vegetarian meal, 
okay? Just, but it's just a vegetarian meal, just cooked by a non-devotee. Option B. Option C. I can make that same vegetarian meal, offer it to Krishna. So now it's prashadam. And I can honor that. So option A, you create impious karma that you have to burn off in the form of suffering because you've eaten something um, impious. Option B, it's not impious. You had something vegetarian, okay? But you didn't offer it to Krishna. So some pious credit, which goes down, right? So let's say option B, you cooked it and you gave some of that vegan or vegetarian food to a homeless person who needed some food, right? So you did something pious with it. But that piety is going to run out. Option C, you cooked a vegetarian meal, you offered it to the Lord. So in option B and C, you still had a meal. In options B and C, you still ate something which filled you up. But in the last option, you did it for Krishna. So this is the essence of Krishna consciousness. You're going to live, you're going to eat, you're going to spend time, you're going to do all kinds of activities. If you do it for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the benefit is eternal. And interestingly enough, the benefit is internal. So Krishna consciousness means eternal and internal. By engaging what I'm going to do anyway in Krishna's service, the benefit lasts forever. So it's eternal. And because I did it for Krishna's pleasure, the benefit lasts forever. And the benefit also is within me, internal. When I do devotional service sincerely, I feel a happiness within. And that happiness that I feel within is a happiness that I can never get from outside. What is the happiness within? When Krishna's in the heart, which he is always, and he's pleased by your devotional service, by our devotional service, him being pleased causes us to feel a great sense of inner pleasure. There's a statement that the pure devotee has no ability to, to recognize happiness except from the happiness that Krishna is feeling. So their pleasure is actually Krishna's pleasure. Their bliss is actually them sharing in the bliss of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So it's very logical. In fact, it, it is not only compelling logic, it is conclusive logic. You're gonna do, you're gonna move about in this world anyway. Do it for Krishna. You're gonna work anyway, work for Krishna. You're gonna serve anyway, serve for Krishna. You're gonna eat anyway, eat for Krishna. Because when you do this, the benefit is eternal and internal. The benefit lasts. In this verse, Narada Muni, in his advice to um, Dhruva, he says, one should try to keep himself satisfied in any condition of life, whether distress or happiness, which is offered by the Supreme Will. A person who endures in this way is able to cross over the darkness of nescience. But look at that, not just able to cross over, he says very easily. One of the things that's been exciting me so much, I mean so much in life, is when I look at these verses and purples, you can see there's very practical advice. Not only are we given practical advice, you're given the result that will happen if we follow the advice. And at this point, I'm going to open this up. So I'd like to explore, we'll take questions, but I also want to explore with you how we can practically apply the advice that is being given by Narada Muni in this verse to Dhruva Maharaj. 
In other words, I'd like to hear from you. How do we keep ourselves satisfied in any condition of life, which is the advice being given here, so that we can, as also stated in this verse, cross over the darkness of nescience and especially to cross over it, these last two words really stood out to me, very easily. Okay, so let's explore how do I, as an individual, practically apply the advice of Narada Muni so I can experience the benefit of moving through the world and crossing through the darkness of nescience in this world, <laughs> and I'd love to do it very easily. Okay, the way we're going to do this is as follows. I'm going to ask all of you in the chat window on Zoom, share your advice. How, how do you or how would you advise a devotee to keep themselves satisfied in any condition of life? Okay, what's the mindset I should have? How should I live? What's the lifestyle I should have? What should I do in order to be satisfied in any condition of life? I'd like everyone to share their answer in the chat window on Zoom and send to everyone. Okay. Thank you, Shamrani. I love that point. We'd like everyone. What's the mindset? What, how should I behave so that I practice this idea of being satisfied in any condition of life? What are some things to do? What are some things that I need to avoid in order to keep oneself satisfied in any condition of life? I'm going to pause there and let everyone type and share with everyone on Zoom, then we're going to start to explore your ideas. Thank you, Namrata Prabhu. I think, that's, I think both things have been shared from Shamrani and Namrata, these are really powerful. The reason why I'm using this technique, especially with all of you, is because I want us to also practice this. What we're practicing is translating the Bhagavatam into our practical behaviors in our lives. We often don't do this. We often read and go home, right? But we're practicing making the teachings practically applied in our day-to-day -day lives. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Shamrani, if you're comfortable, would you like to expand or elaborate on the point that you made, which is always keeping Krishna in the center? Hare Krishna Prabhu, please accept my humble advances. Um, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for sharing um, uh, such a wonderful, a wonderful um, um, this is topic, isn't it? And um, really nicely explained by Shira Prabhupada, but you made this, um, explained it even so nicely, Prabhu. Thank you so much. So um, it's, it is difficult why, you know, uh, keeping Krishna always in the center. I know I'm saying it, but I, at least we try that as in like, uh, um, I mean to say by that, whatever you do. So for instance, like, um, you know, okay, I have a garden. So like we grow plants and trees and stuff like that. And so we, we always try and kind of think that, okay, we grow, we're going to grow nice plants. They go, the beautiful flower is going to grow and we're going to offer it um, to Krishna. So kind of, you know, we always think that he's, the Supreme Lord has given us um, everything and we kind of, kind of offering him back, back to him. And um, the satisfaction and the love you get um, is, um, I think, really nice, actually, really nice feelings um, uh, we get. And same thing, you know, I mean, cooking or whatever, I mean, shopping or so we try kind of that, you know, uh, follow the same thing that we always think that, um, you know, whatever we're doing, basically, we're offering back to Krishna and um, by eating prasadam, as you said, um, that you know, um, saying the prayers and um, eating, offering and then eating the prasadam is just, um, it's the satisfaction and love. And I think it's always helping us to um, think positive um, and our mindset definitely eating, by eating prasadam is so many ways is helping us um, 
um, to overcome the so many different difficulties. And uh, that's what we think anyway, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so this is very good. I, I want to get into this dialogue. We're going to hear from a few people just to elaborate on their idea. Shamrani, when I saw your comment, and I was thinking how I can apply this practically, I remembered, okay, first of all, I have deities. We have deities. We see that suffering comes when I think it's mine. This is mine. That's mine. And then, of course, because I think it's mine, that's the first difficulty. Then when I lose it, which I definitely will, I become unhappy. When I saw your comment, always keeping Christian in the center, I remember the class that I heard from one Prabhupada disciple. He said that what you can do in life is that you can actually, when you wake up in the morning, you can say a prayer, Krishna, this day belongs to you. Please make the day go, and, and I belong to you. Please use me as your instrument, you know? Another thing that came to mind, I, I thought about this point from your point, Shamrani. What can I do to deepen this meditation? And it occurred to me, I can actually spend my day, and whenever I see anything, I can think, this is Krishna. This is Krishna's house. This is Krishna's car. This is Krishna's devotee. And I was thinking that if I remember that, so rather than I'm going to engage this thing in Krishna's service, mm -hmm. which is often what we think, because behind that, what's implied? If I say I'm going to engage this in your service, Krishna, oftentimes what's actually going on subconsciously is I think it's my thing, which mm -hmm. I'm going to give to Krishna. Yeah. But this is different. This is actually remembering, okay, no, no. Let's start from the beginning. It's Krishna's house. It's never, it was never mine in the first place. Yeah. And the more, if, I mean, just imagine how much progress people will make spiritually. If we, if we go through our day remembering this is Krishna's cat house, Krishna's car, Krishna's devotee who I am looking after as a husband, wife, child, etc., elders. If I start practicing that meditation, or in the house, this, this, um, the chairs belong to the Dev, right, our deity. This sofa belongs to the Dev. So I can start getting out of the center by putting Krishna in the center. And I start to make decisions on that basis. How does Krishna want his house to be? How does Krishna want me to look after his pen? How does Krishna want me to use his time? And as we do this, just imagine the blessings and the empowerment and the spiritual connection that we start to experience. So, I mean, there's so many good points all of you have shared already, and I want to encourage you. This has been a life transformative. This has been a life changing practice for me. When I read, I'm trying to think, how does this apply practically? Right? Not just yeah. it's a nice philosophy, but and you may not be able to do it with every single sentence that you come across. Okay. But whenever you come across things, oh, so it says here, I should be satisfied in any condition of life. What can I do practically to practice that behavior? Let's look at a few more people. I'm going to go to a few other people who, uh, who made some com um, comments. Um, I love this one, Hetal. And this is something I've, I've tried to practice over the years, and it's, it's really helped. I mean, it's really changed my life. Hetal, if you're comfortable, can you speak a bit more about this idea of becoming sensitive and aware to the super soul within the hearts of others? I, I find that really powerful because where I've tried to practice is connecting with the super soul within my heart through trying to see what's in line with Guru Sadhu Shastra, but I've not done as much about becoming sensitive and aware to the super soul within the hearts of other people. Hetal, Please tell me more about this and how this will help us to be satisfied in any condition of life, please. Hare Krishna. Actually, I haven't figured this out yet completely, but um, something happened over Janmashtami. I was working, uh, well, serving, um, and basically I, did, I, made, I made a decision which I thought was fair to both parties, but I, I offended one person. And I realized then that probably the decision was fair, but the way I delivered the message was not customized 
to the other devotee who got offended. So I think immediately after I got the feedback back from this devotee, I felt really um, upset. I didn't feel good, just didn't feel good. And I realized then that I had made a mistake, not in the decision that I made, but the way I delivered the message. So I don't know, I think that, that made me realize that um, we have to be sensitive to other people and how um, we treat them. Thank you so much, Hetal. I mean, that's a really brilliant point. Your comment has sparked a remembrance of something that my spiritual master spoke about. He said that when you communicate with people, if you are conscious that Krishna is in their heart, they belong to Krishna. And if you try to speak to the soul of the person, the higher self of the person, then your message will have a much deeper impact on the individual that you're dealing with. And, and just think about it, just think how much our behavior would be different if every time we met someone, we remembered actually Krishna's sitting there in that person's heart. We'd be a lot more careful about what we say, what we do, what we don't do, because we remember Krishna's there in their heart. This is absolutely extraordinarily powerful. So thank you for that head talk. Let's go to someone else. I would like to hear from Archana City. It's so powerful and we don't do this enough, but you're writing about reading the Bhagavatam regularly so that when suffering and happiness comes, we know why these happen. And we're, we're doing this now in some small way, but yes, the Bhagavatam has the ability to make people detached from material energy. Archana City, can you expand on what you've written in your comment, please? Uh, yes, Prabhu, thank you so much. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, uh, Prabhu, um, um, for me personally, um, the basis of my um, spiritual um, practice is uh, reading Bhagavatam because I have seen if I don't read Bhagavatam, my chanting gets affected. And um, uh, also when I deal with the outside world material activities even spiritual activities um, I um, I'm able to better understand why all this is happening because of reading Bhagavatam because each and every word of Bhagavatam it it's just um, just sits in my heart and uh, um, say for example the words today's verse is something that I always like and I always pull that verse whenever I um, had, um, you know, bad time uh, suffering that I'm not able to control. Um, so I'm always able to get back to Bhagavatam and I understand why this all is happening. Once you find those answers in Bhagavatam, you know, it is absolute truth. And there is not much, nothing at my end I have to do now. I just have to surrender. So that that's what I, I felt like reading Bhagavatam for me is the basis of uh, uh, all the spiritual activities for me. Thank you very much, Archana Siddhi. As a movement, we don't really understand the transformative, the transformative power of Prabhupada's books. Anyone, I repeat, anyone who regularly reads Prabhupada's books will find that they become detached from material suffering. It's that powerful, but it's, it's something, it's a southerner. So it's something that needs to be done and done regularly. Then you find, then you really, then you can consciously feel, hold on, something that would upset me a year ago, now I'm not affected by it. It really is powerful. And what to speak of the fact that the Bhagavatam is a literary incarnation. So what happens is you're in regular contact with Krishna in his direct form as the literature. And that literature is the Srimad Bhagavatam. So what happens if you're always in touch with Krishna regularly is that you become like him because you become like whatever you associate with, you know? So I, I really want to encourage all of you, if you want to accelerate your spiritual life and you want to feel that spiritual effect in your consciousness, not just something theoretical, but you want to feel, hold on, I'm changing. I, I'm not affected by things which used to disturb me. I can see the world more clearly. 
if you want that, I, I know devotees who, who read Bhagavatam every day and they I can I, you can see the difference between the ones who read Bhagavatam every day and the ones who don't. It's so obvious. Because the ones who read the Bhagavatam every day, they're not so affected by the material energy because it gives all of these powerful gifts to the, to the individual just, who, just by them reading and reflecting on the Bhagavatam on a regular basis. Thank you so much for sharing that, Arjuna Siddhi. Um, I'm going to go to one or two more people. Um, let's see. I'd like to hear... I'd like to hear from Bal Krishna Prabhu. Try your best and tolerate the suffering while taking necessary help from the devotees and with happiness not to get carried away. Bal Krishna, can you tell us more, please? Hare Krishna Bhutapavana Prabhu, I'm grateful to be here in your present time and amongst all this much noise. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I frequently like hearken back to one of the first statements that Krishna makes in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, to to tolerate the vagaries of the material world and of our own karma, um, I feel like by tolerating we we are also taking the humble place, and we are not like accumulating more karma by responding to to like difficult situations, um, and and of course like by tolerating I don't mean like just gritting my teeth. But, taking the necessary help be it from the scriptures, from the devotees, from devotional service, whatever works for us. And uh, by happiness, I mean, I, f I figured like, uh, I mean, after a certain point, we realized that even the happiness is temporary. So we see that in the world, we see that in our own lives too. So um, I think that comes more easily to not get carried away with the happiness, but tolerating the difficulties is much, much harder for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the happiness of the material world is temporary, but spiritual happiness is not temporary. So when we try our best to tolerate the suffering while taking help from the devotees by doing these other things, hearing Bhagavatam chanting, you get a happiness which is spiritual. And because you have a spiritual happiness, then, you, then it's easy to tolerate the, hap the material happiness and distress which is external. But again, it's your point. It's, and I really take your point, taking necessary help from the devotees. That's one way in which we can keep ourselves satisfied because now we're not relying on our own strength in every situation, but rather we're relying on the collective strength of our association with devotees, especially sincere devotees, mature devotees who have our best interests at heart. So that's a very, very powerful technique. Very, very powerful. Um, let's go to one more. Namrata, whatever you have a passion for, connect it with Krishna. Tell me more, Namrata, about how this helps one to remain satisfied in any situation. Because again, reminding us all, if we do this, what, what Narada Muni, who's a pure devotee is saying, it allows us to cross over the darkness of nescience very easily. If we put some of these practices into our lives and we do it consistently, we will be very easily able to move through the nescience of the material world, the ignorance of the material world. And that's an incredible gift. Namrata Prabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna. Oh, Hare Krishna. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, elaborating on my point, so very firstly, uh, amazing lecture, Prabhuji. I'm, I'm very glad whenever I'm attending your lecture. So thank you for uh, your preaching. And elaborating on um, my point uh, was, uh, if you're having passion for certain things, maybe material, like if you are uh, good at art, if you are interested, you're more passionate about cooking, uh, if you are, you love to take care of your child. So uh, whatever you have the most interest in, if you uh, uh, relate it or, you know, attach that thing 
with uh, krishna activities you will do it more uh, you know the passion will be converted to krishna yes so uh, that will be more efficiently and the whatever you want to do will be delivered more strongly to krishna so uh, that is how i am seeing this thing uh, i would like your opinion as well thank you thank you and this is exactly correct there's a whole science of how the things that we do in the world as long as they're not sinful we can connect it to krishna and because we do it for him we get the spiritual benefit and we also become detached from the material energy so it's a really good process and we can even practice this through prayer before we do something we can say krishna please accept this activity as an offering unto you you know and please bless me with spiritual advancement we could there's so many ways in which we can apply the teachings if we're conscious therefore props said you have to become conscious before you can become krishna conscious i I'll, i'll elaborate further on this verse and then we'll open up for questions so here in this verse one should try to keep himself satisfied in any condition of life it's very interesting and in any condition that means also that what we don't want to do is tell ourselves in our own mind or by our behavior that i will be happy only when this happens you see if we keep living our life yeah you know until i achieve this or i achieve that i'm not going to be happy then we're not going to be satisfied we'll be dissatisfied we'll always feel that happiness will come tomorrow happiness will come when i get this happiness will come when this stops happening to me what we want to do is learn to actually or really understand the truth which is that happiness is based upon our state of consciousness not based upon the things which are around us yeah that's the key thing a, what does it mean to be a conditioned soul a conditioned soul thinks happiness is based upon the state of my conditions a devotee thinks happiness is based upon the state of my consciousness and that's actually true that is actually true our happiness is based ultimately about based upon the state of our consciousness so the more that we spend so if we've got time and energy most people with the time and energy they try and change all the conditions because they think that by changing the conditions they'll be happy we'll be happy we think that a devotee thinks let me change the state of my consciousness because if i can change the state of my consciousness then i can be truly satisfied okay so let's stop there and i'm going to open up for any questions or comments that you may have Prabhu ji you want to take one more verse uh, number 34 verse no need uh, we can actually do it on another occasion i think we'll just keep okay. with this one for today sure prabhu okay uh, devotees if you have any questions or comments uh, you can go ahead thank you prabhu ji for the one nice class thank you no oh, thank you are there any questions hare krishna prabhu ji hare krishna Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful explanation prabhu ji uh, in the beginning of the class you um, said that uh, when krishna is happy we feel an um, internal pleasure yes that's how <clears throat> we know that um, you know we, we can understand that krishna is happy now how do we dip- how do we differentiate between um, say when uh, uh, when we are feeling um uh, uh whether krishna is happy uh, this pleasure is caused by krishna's happiness or this pleasure is caused by our uh, anarthas being satisfied um our senses being satisfied so 
The question is, is in one sense, not quite right. In other words, Rishi Kena Rishi Kesha Sevanam Bhakti Ukyate. Devotional service is performed with the senses. So it's not Krishna's pleased or our senses are satisfied. Actually, both things can happen simultaneously. For example, you may have prashadam. You may go to a feast. Let's say it was Radharani's appearance day. And you go to the temple and you have a feast. Krishna's pleased because you're honoring his prashadam, but your senses are also satisfied because you're having Krishna's remnants. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. But the key thing to bear in mind is that we follow the scripture. We follow guru, sadhu, and shastra. Okay, so when we're, when we're doing things in line with the teachings, then we can know definitely that is pleasing to Krishna. Moreover, moreover, when we, we can know that we're following Guru, Sadhu and Shastra in a very good way, in, in, a, in a very deep way, when we feel an increasing enthusiasm for devotional life. Huh? So it's just like this. You know that your disease is going away when you feel more and more healthy and you feel less and less sick. So when the spiritual health is going up, I'm more excited about Krishna consciousness. I'm more excited about chanting the holy names of Krishna. I'm more excited about serving Krishna. I'm more excited about associating with the devotees. That means your spiritual health is going up. And when the disease is going down, that means ah, I don't want to just waste time doing materialistic things. I, I'm, I don't want to be in the modes of passion and ignorance. I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, my lust is going down. My greed is going down. My material attachment is going down. So these are things that we can all experience. Am I finding more inspiration and enthusiasm in my spiritual journey? That's a good sign. Am I finding less attachment? Am I finding that I'm becoming more detached from being engaged in materialistic activities? Good sign. So these are some of the ways in which we can know that we're progressing properly and that Krishna is pleased. Does that answer your question, Arjuna Siddhi? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Prabhu, very beautiful answer. Prabhu, can I, uh, I think this is, uh, this next question would be related. Um, what is the difference between uh, expecting love and appreciation from others uh, or feeling um, and between feeling pride? You know, like sometimes we want um, to uh, everyone to say, uh, you, you made nice garlands, you made, um, you, f you feel that appreciation but then sometimes it gets to a pride that, oh, I can, yes, I can make nice garlands. So how? It's a very good question. Let me, just give me a moment. Okay. So pride means that I think I'm in the center. I'm superior, I'm special in some way. So pride, the reason why pure devotees are humble is because they don't put themselves in the center. Okay? Now, that's slightly different, or it can be different from having a need. See, if I expect devotees to praise me, then actually, to be honest, what will happen is Krishna will pick that up that you, you're looking for praise. Now, that's different to wanting to serve nicely. See, this is the beauty of Krishna consciousness. The idea is not that I should expect praise of, of other devotees. What I should think is let me serve those devotees nicely. And what happens is, see, this is, this is real faith. Real faith means that just by serving Krishna, in the way that he explains he should be served, that just by doing that, everything else will be fulfilled. So if I think the devotees should praise me, usually what will happen is I will not get much praise. 
something will happen. And also, if I expect praise, see, this is the other thing. This is very interesting. Praise and blame are two sides of the same coin. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna always tells Arjuna, one who is equipoise in honor and dishonor, in fame and infamy, he is my devotee. So the reason why the devotees, we, the reason why we should not do something so that the devotees will praise us is that if you, if you live with that mentality and if you cultivate that mentality, then when the inevitable happens, which is someone will criticize you or someone won't like what you're doing, then you'll be very hurt by that, you see? If you're dependent upon praise, you'll be very hurt when you get blamed and you'll also be very hurt when you're neglected, you see? Because mm -hmm. sometimes this will happen in the material world. Sometimes you do very good service and the person has something, some difficulty at home or they've got difficulty with their health, or difficulty with their family, or difficulty in their relationships. And because of that difficulty, they're preoccupied. It's, it's all that they're thinking about. So when you do nice service, they don't even notice because their mind is elsewhere. But because you're dependent on their praise, then the fact that they didn't say anything, or even that they may have criticized what you did, that will hurt you. And it will, uh, that will hurt us. And it will be our own fault because we cultivated this mentality. What Krishna recommends instead is that serve devotees as best as you can. Especially serve your spiritual master as best as you can. And by doing that, especially when we serve sincere devotees, automatically they'll be pleased with us. And that pleasure may come in the form of nice words. That pleasure may, they're, they're being pleased with us, may come because they speak to someone else and say, you know what, Archana Siddhi, she's such a nice devotee. She cooked this or she made this or she served in this way. You may even hear about it in other ways. But most importantly, if you serve the devotees nicely, Krishna will be satisfied and therefore you'll feel some fulfillment in your heart, whether or not people praise you. You see, in your question, what's, what we're assuming is that I need their praise to be happy. That's not true. Mm -hmm. You can be happy even without being praised externally. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 What you, what you actually are looking for is happiness and contentment. Mm -hmm. Because we're conditioned, we think it's going to come this way. I want to be happy. Therefore, people have to praise me because when I'm praised, I'll be happy. But what Krishna consciousness teaches us is that you can be happy even when you're criticized if you're deeply Krishna conscious. Mm. Yeah? So the secret is to serve the devotee sincerely and do not allow ourselves to be de become dependent upon the praise of other people. Because if we're dependent upon the praise of other people, then when the inevitable neglect or criticism comes, which will happen in the material world, because that's the nature of the material world, then as much as we're elated in, in praise, we'll feel completely distraught, distressed, and disappointed in criticism or blame. And we would have set ourselves up for feeling that way because we've become attached to the external praise. Does that make some sense? Yes, yes, Prabhu. Very much, very, very much. This is very deep and profound. And I, this answer will stay with me. It, it will really stay. I will always uh, meditate on this. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Well, well, you've made a very powerful point. I'm just going to draw upon what you've just said, Archana Siddhi. I was, I was in communication with some of the, some devotees, and I shared the verse. Oh, it was a verse or some writing by one spiritual master, I believe. And I said to them, if we meditate on what we're reading, it's very good. Because by meditating on what we read, it goes deeper into the consciousness. 
and it starts to transform us. I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so excited about what the future holds in Krishna consciousness. Because I see that if, it's not just a question of taking the medicine, like the scriptures, they're medicine, but, it, but how, how healthy you become is based upon two things. It's about taking the medicine, that's number one, and taking the medicine properly or effectively, that's number two. So when you're speaking, Archana Siddhi, and you said, I will, I will meditate on this, I'll, it will stay in my mind, I'll keep thinking about it. That's, that's the second part of spiritual life or spiritual practice. It's how we take the medicine. And I can see, I've seen over my years in Krishna consciousness, the devotees can have a much deeper, much more blissful spiritual life if they understood these two things. Most devotees, they only understand that I've got to take the medicine. So they get something and, and they make some progress, it's true. But they would make faster progress and deeper progress if they thought I've got to take the medicine and I've got to take the medicine as effectively as possible. So that's why I, I love this discussion that we've had. Because if you've noticed in this conversation, it's not just me speaking. And in this conversation, it's not just even reading the scripture. We've read the scripture, this verse in purple, Travana. Then we discussed how do I make this real in my life, which is Manana and Nididhyasana. So Shravana, we've heard. Manana, we've reflected on it. Nididhyasana, we thought, how do I practice this idea of being satisfied in any condition? How do I practice this? Pra how do I practice this in a practical, tangible way in my life? Nididhyasana. So do you feel the difference? Do you feel the difference? That it takes the scripture and it makes it more and more real and applied practically. Otherwise, we read, we hear philosophy, we go home. You read, hear philosophy, go home. This is something different. This is hear philosophy, think about the philosophy, think about what the philosophy means for me, and then apply the philosophy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practice many of the ideas that you've shared on this call. I'm going to practice it. I'm going to start practicing, trying to be mindful. It's Krishna's house, not my house. It's Krishna's devotee, not my partner, mum, dad, child. Yeah? I'm going to start practicing. Okay, my passions. Am I engaging my passions in Krishna's service? Right? I'm going to practice. Let me read Bhagavatam more. And not just read. Let me read it and keep thinking, how do I apply this practically in my life? How would I explain this to the devotees? Let me build a relationship with the Bhagavatam, knowing that if I do these things, it's going to transform me. And that's for, that for me, and, and, and I'm sure it's the same for all of us, it's exciting when you see you've, you've transformed. It's exciting when you see you've come to a higher level of spiritual consciousness. Let's do this together. Let's not just, let's take the teachings off the pages of the Bhagavatam and let's, let's allow these teachings to be deeply entering into and to be deeply absorbed into our hearts and our consciousness. Thank you very much, Archon City. Are there any Thank other you. questions? Krishna Prabhuji, I don't have any questions, but uh, okay. I have. Yeah, yes. Oh, sorry, um, Mataji, please continue. No, no, I was just uh, thanking Prabhuji that, um, and whatever discussion they, uh, Achana Siddhi Mataji and Prabhuji had, it was really wonderful. And even um, uh, even I go with Achana Siddhi Mataji's comments, like whatever uh, I hear in classes, I pick up some points and try to meditate on them so that I can keep remembering them because uh, sometimes we hear the lecture and we forget the um, important points in that. So if you meditate on them, or uh, then, then only we can remember easily. Um, I feel like that, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh,
Namrata Mataji, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mataji. Uh, uh, Prabhupada, uh, there is one thing I wanted to ask. Um, if a person is holding um, uh, grudges against another person, uh, well, not exactly grudges, but uh, if a person is, uh, uh, you know, uh, facing some difficulties, maybe some emotional difficulties because of uh, other person's, uh, uh, let's say, ego or anger or envy or any kind of thing. And if if the person is not from the family or maybe not from the loved ones or the closer person, then you can avoid that person like if if you if the person is in office or in you know your friend or you can avoid that person but if the person is in family it's hard to uh, avoid that person and then this thing you know this facing of all this negativity continues for a longer period of time and then uh they develop the grudges against each other. So how do we understand this? That um, I, I have uh, uh, asked this thing to another one of uh, devotees also. They uh, th that person answered that it's not. It's always between uh, the person and the Krishna, not between the two individual persons. So you have to take it that way. But I still want to understand it more clearly. That how do we take it that it, it's always between, uh, say, me and that person or the person? And, you know, how do we understand that it's between me and Krishna, not between another person? Okay. So let me just meditate on this a moment. It's a very deep topic. It's a very, and I'm really glad that you asked this question. I feel also very much that I, I want to thank all of you. When we discuss this, I always feel that in, in these discussions, Krishna gives so much rich mercy in terms of wisdom, in terms of guidance. And he's helping us to, to learn what we need to learn to move forward. So Namrata, thank you so much for your question. This is something I've been thinking about a lot. There's a few things that I've, I hope, I, I, there's a few things that I feel by the mercy of the Guru Parampara we've had, we've been able to realize about this. My spiritual master said, we each and every one of us have our own battle of Kurukshetra. Does that make sense, first of all? Yeah? That means, yes. and, it, and this is really important. What that means is you may have a challenge in your spiritual life. And what's a challenge for you, someone else may have the same thing in their spiritual life and they're not bothered by it. And we may think, no, but it would trouble anyone. And it, but no, not necessarily. For someone else, the same challenge is not a bother for them. Uh, that's the first thing. So we each have our unique challenges based upon the conditioning we have in this lifetime, you see? So I know some people who, when they deal with family members who are negative, they just, they're just very comfortable asserting themselves. They're very comfortable having a very direct conversation saying, look, with all due respect, this isn't work for me, and so on and so on and so on. And someone else will struggle to have that conversation. So the first point to understand is, we each have unique challenges that we have to work through in order to become Krishna conscious. That's point number one. Point number two is that the reason why we say it's between us and Krishna is because those challenges are based upon our own previous behavior. You see, that's why we say that. There are no accidents. So therefore, some of the challenges I, I deal with are due to behaviors that I've done myself in a previous life. And I was unaware. You see? 
So because I was unaware, oh, so when I get the bad experiences, what Krishna is showing me is, look, in a previous life, you were like this. It's very interesting. I, yes, it is hard. It is hard. And I'm not saying that it's easy. And I'm not saying it means that we should be negative to ourselves or blame ourselves. Let's be very clear. But let's be very clear. We've had billions of lifetimes. Are we all clear on that? Not one life. We've been in a male body, in a female body. We've been in different animal species. We've been in the heavenly planets. We've practically done everything. So when something happens, oh, but I'm such a good person. Yeah, but how many lifetimes ago? This is happening based upon something we've done way before. I'll tell you a story. In the Mahabharata, at the end of the Battle of Kurukshetra, Dhritarashtra asks a question. He asks, why was I born blind? That's his question. And he asks, why is it my 100 sons had to die in the Battle of Kurukshetra? And he's given an answer, which, I, which is always very instructive. Dhritarashtra is told, he's told 50 lifetimes ago, you were a hunter. And you shot a flaming arrow into a nest of birds. And he's told that that flaming arrow, it killed the birds in that nest. Huh? It killed the 100 birds in the nest. The flames from the arrow, it didn't kill the parents, the parent birds. They flew away. But the flames from the arrow seared their eyes. So the parent birds flew away, they got away, but they were blinded by the flames from the arrow. And he was told, this is a reason why in this lifetime, your 100 sons had to die and you were born blind. The trust that asks, he, he, he inquires more. He says, I understand that. Okay, that makes sense. He says, but that was 50 lifetimes ago. Why? Did I have to be born blind in this lifetime and lose my 100 sons in this lifetime? And he was told, he said, it's because it took you 50 lifetimes to come to the point of having 100 sons. So the reason why we say is between us and Krishna is because the challenges we face in this lifetime reflect our previous karmic behaviors in a previous life, you see? Now, that's a hard thing to feel emotionally. And the usual thing, and I'm gonna ask you not to go in this direction, usually when people will hear this, they think, oh, but you're saying it's my fault and I feel bad and, no, no. It's not like that at all. We've all done all of these things. There'll be some of your friends, they've got karma that they're gonna experience and they're not experiencing it in this lifetime but it's there and they're gonna experience it next lifetime. Because, we, because we've been in the material world for billions of lifetimes, you never experience all of your karma in one life, unless you're a devotee, because Krishna can minimize it. Everyone that you know, who's not practicing Krishna consciousness, they're carrying billions, if not more, lifetimes of karma. And in the life that you're seeing them, they're just, they're just dealing with a, 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 a fraction of their karma because you can't, you can't go through all the karma of all the billions of lives in one life. It, it, you wouldn't be, it would be too much. The karma is so big that you only go, you only experience a portion of it in each lifetime. If you're a non-devotee, if you're a devotee, Krishna can minimize it. So you only go through some karmic reaction in this life to finish off. And then you can go back home, back to Godhead. But normally, whenever you see people walking around, they are experiencing a small portion of literally countless lifetimes of karma. And just a small portion is coming through in this one life. So the first thing is, if we understand that, I'm it means I'm responsible. Prabhupada made a very interesting statement. He said, it, it said if you don't work through whatever held you back, so let's put it another way. Prabhupada emphasized that 
whatever caused you not to go back to Krishna in your previous life, it will come up again in your next life. And if you don't deal with it and work through it in this life, then it will just come up again in another life. You see, in other words, the lessons that you don't pass do not pass you. Now, I was meditating on this a lot and then something happened in my heart and I'll be on, I'll, I want to share this with you. After meditating on this truth, I, was, I started to access a certain level of personal empowerment because I started to realize that actually the issue is not the challenge. The issue is not the challenge. The issue is how strong I am in relationship to the challenge. Has anyone ever been on holiday and then they came back home from their holiday? If you have, raise your hand, raise your electronic hand. I shall, I'll show you why I'm saying this. Has anyone ever been on holiday and then they came back home after the holiday? Yes or no, just raise your hand, electronic hand. You can use your, yeah, okay, me too. Now, it's interesting. So you come back from holiday and you've got your suitcase and you're gonna carry your suitcase upstairs to your room, okay? Now, what determines how easy or hard it is to carry the suitcase upstairs? I'm gonna ask you this question, I'm gonna explain. So, someone could, so I'm gonna ask someone to just say the answer. What determines how hard it is for you to carry your suitcase back upstairs when you come back from holiday? What's the answer? What makes, what determines how hard it is? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Bo. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. It's, it's the, um, the weight of the suitcase. That's a very interesting answer, Smitha. And your answer makes sense. It makes complete sense. But I'm going to go to Hetel's point. Because Hetel's point is even more specific to what we're, we're looking to understand, okay? So yes, the suitcase may be heavy, but how hard it is, is dependent on how strong you are in comparison to how heavy the suitcase is. Does that make some sense, everyone? So we often think, Oh, the suitcase is so heavy, it's just so hard to deal with. What we don't notice is how strong am I? How much strength, and in our case, how much spiritual strength have I been developing? Why was Prabhupada able to come by himself to the West, to New York, alone, at, in an advanced age and spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. It wasn't that things were easy, but why was he able to do it? It's because he was so strong, you see? And to your point, Hetal, which I think is very important, so I'm gonna bring your point into this conversation. There are many things outside of our control. In fact, there are at least 8 billion things outside of our control. What do I mean by that? What are the 8 billion things which are outside of our control? What am I talking about? What are the 8 billion things outside of our control? Any guesses? Yes, exactly, Hetal. Other people, they're outside of our control. But we, we can do something about ourselves. The way that Maya tricks us as devotees, she wants you to think that you're powerless. Maya wants you to think that you're a victim and that 
your situation is completely dependent on the circ on the circumstances or the situation. So she wants you to think oh, the reason why I'm struggling is because it's the suitcase. It's all about the suitcase. It's all about how heavy the suitcase is. It's all about how big the suitcase is. It's all about how the suitcase is, is, is a strange shape. She wants you to think it's all about something outside of your control. Because then you'll give up and you'll feel like you're a victim. But what Krishna is saying, even what this verse is saying, is the opposite. What this verse is saying is you work on yourself so that you have a certain kind of consciousness no matter what condition of life you're in. You see? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't avoid bad situations. It doesn't mean that we don't speak up if we need to. But it means that every day I'm doing whatever I can to make myself stronger. When I read the Bhagavatam and discuss it with devotees, I'm making myself stronger. When I apply the Bhagavatam properly, I'm making myself stronger. When I chant the holy name sincerely and attentively, I'm making myself stronger. And actually, what it means is that, and this is actually what's happened to all of us. You don't know it, but there's some challenges that you've had in spiritual life and you didn't even know it was a challenge. Why? Because you were so strong that it, that it was an easy thing for you to pass. It was an easy lesson for you to learn. It was an, an easy experience for you to go through. And that same experience, which was easy for you to go through, someone else who's a devotee, if they, have had, if they had had to go through the same experience, for them, it would have been so hard. And they would have thought, this is too difficult. You know, why, why this big challenge is so hard? But for you, it was easy and you didn't even notice it was a, it was a challenge because it's your strength relative to the challenge itself that determines how you deal with it. I want, to, I want all of us to remember this. It's every single day, every single moment is an opportunity to become more and more strong and powerful as a devotee. To be really honest, the majority of devotees in our spiritual communities, they forget this. And therefore, they don't take the opportunities to make themselves stronger. And because they don't take the opportunity to make themselves stronger, when the inevitable tests come into their life, then they think, oh, Krishna, why, why is Krishna doing this to me? Oh, Krishna, oh, Krishna, why? Why? It's so hard. It's so. Yes, it's hard. But I gave you a year to make yourself stronger. You didn't take the opportunity up. I gave you 10 years to read and chant and, and learn. You didn't take the opportunity. So now when the test has come, you're finding it hard to pass the test. But had you done what I told you to do previously, then when the test came, you would have passed the test very easily. So we, we are like children at school. We all remember there was someone at school who messed around in the lessons. They didn't listen to the teacher. They didn't learn, they didn't read, they didn't do the essays, they didn't write. They didn't take notes. And then at the end of the year, when the exam came, they said, oh, it's so difficult. It's such a hard exam. Oh, it's so difficult. Yes, it is. But it wasn't difficult for everyone in the class. For the people who used their time to learn, when the test came, they were able to pass it very easily. This is the principle of spiritual empowerment. What Krishna, what Srila Prabhupada is begging all of us to do 
He's saying, look, the material energy is very difficult. Psst, listen, there's the test coming up. It may be a difficult test, but I can show you how to pass the tests. Every day learn, every day chant, every day do your homework nicely. And if you always do this, then whenever the test comes, you will be so learned, so spiritually strong that the test won't disturb you. You know, I had, um, when Chandramali Maharaj came to the UK recently, I'll, I'll share with you something, it was very interesting. It, it was very instructive and I knew he was saying this for my learning. He told me something about his God brother. We were sitting down together at a program. It was an event for Bhakti Charu Maharaj's um, disappearance celebration in London. It was a big event. Many devotees were there and Chandra Muli Maharaj spoke at the event. After the event, we were taking prashadam. And he, he turned to me. And he said to me, you know, Radnath Maharaj, you said, he said to me, he said, Radnath Maharaj, his mind is completely fixed. He told me, he told me that. He said to me, he's definitely always thinking of Krishna. Now, why did he tell me that? We know in our lives, and we know in the life of Prabhupada, and definitely in the lives of other great devotees, they meet different challenges. But you know, one of the most powerful things about studying Prabhupada's books and the process of bhakti yoga, the process of Krishna consciousness, is if we do it properly, the mind becomes fixed on who? If we engage in Krishna consciousness properly, the mind becomes fixed on who? What's the answer? Krishna. Yes. Now, it, there's a lot to this. If the mind is fixed on Krishna, then when people do things in our lives, which would normally cause us to have this kind of thing going on in the mind, the mind would be really disturbed, flickering. Chanchala himana Krishna. Arjuna says this, the mind is flickering by nature. Well, if the mind is fixed on Krishna, then people may do something or say something but because our mind is fixed on Krishna, maya sakta manapata, we won't be disturbed even though something is going on. So we think it's because of what they're doing. No, no. It's because our mind is not yet fully fixed. And because our mind is not yet fully fixed, it's still flickering and we get easily disturbed by whatever's happening around us. So I've answered it in a long way, but I really mean this. If we take to the process as deeply as possible, we will become less and less disturbed by whatever situations come upon us in our lives. We'll be better able to understand what's going on. And the last thing I'll leave you with, last two points on this question. The first thing that I try to do in challenging situations is I always try to think, what is Krishna trying to teach me? And I want to invite you all to do the same thing. Lesson number one, try to understand why is Krishna allowing this situation to come into my life? And what is he trying to teach me by this situation? And what I try to do, I don't just try to understand it by my own intelligence, but I try to understand it according to guru, sadhu, and shastra. So I will reach out to my gurus. I will reach out to the sadhus. I will look into the scripture to see what does the scripture say about this. And I'll take advice from my spiritual masters and the sadhus. This is what's happening. What, what do you think Krishna is trying to teach me? What, what do you think is the right way to respond to what's going on? I always do this. And, and I'll be honest, I always get amazing answers and amazing guidance. I was in India, a group of us, I was leading a project. We, had, we, we started these retreats. We would take people to India on retreats. The project was called Mayapur 
worldwide. And there was some politics amongst the devotees who we were organizing with. One devotee in particular. So we went to see Pankajangri Prabhu. And we told him, this devotee, they're playing politics, they're speaking badly about devotees behind their back, etc., etc., and it's causing disturbance. And I said to Pankajangri Prabhu, I said, what, what, what is Krishna trying to teach me from this experience? He told me immediately, he said, Krishna wants you to learn to accept people for who they are. Since that day, it's changed my life. Because when he gave me that instruction, it stopped, it helped me to stop expecting that people should act according to my expectations. It made me stop expecting that people should act like me. Because that's what we often we, we do. We think, well, I'm soft and I'm accommodating, and why can't they be like that? We never really think that actually they are hardwired. So, for example, during this lockdown, the last year or so, some people have had a really good time during lockdown because of coronavirus. Often, the people who've had a great time during lockdown are people who are introverts because they like being by themselves. So this whole period, they've been very happy. Ah, oh, I don't have to speak to anyone. I'm by myself. I can just sit down, spend time by myself. And they loved it. In some respects, the people who've had the most difficulty during this lockdown have been people who are extroverts because they get their energy by being around people. They get, they like, they like to be, they need to be around lots of people so that they can feel energized. And this isn't something that we can control. It's not like I can make myself an extrovert. No, you're born that way. Or I can make myself an introvert. No, you're born that way. So some people are more task oriented by nature. It's not that they're, they're making themselves like that. They're, they're just born like that and they can't really change it. Some people are very direct by nature. They're born like that. They can't change. And we think, well, why, why can't they be a bit more soft? But they're born like that. So in summary, I'd say three points. Number one, in any situation, try to understand what is Krishna trying to teach me? Number two, try to understand it according to Guru Sadhu Shastra. So always take advice, especially when we're in difficult situations and try to tune in to Krishna's advice as it comes through the devotees. So that's number two. And number three, understand that the way that we respond to things is not really just based upon the thing itself. It's not just the, how, how heavy the, um, the suitcase is, but it's how strong I am in contrast or in proportion to how heavy the suitcase is. And this is why we should every day try to make ourselves spiritually stronger. And then if we're doing these three things, then even though we will go through challenges because this is the material world, we will always be having enough strength, enthusiasm and insight to get through, tolerate or overcome each and every challenge that we experience in life. I hope that answers your question. Yes, Prabhuji, it was a very elaborated and very amazing answer that you gave me. Thank you. How I was thinking it, uh, how I was looking at it was like taking the responsibility of what whatever challenges were there in your present life or previous life, according to the karmas. But taking the responsibility and tolerate what uh, the other person is giving. But you gave a new, uh, you know, uh, per, you, you new face to it or perspective to it by giving me a more elaborated answer by uh, um, telling me that understanding the strength and uh, trying to know what Krishna is trying to teach you from that person and through that situation. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. 
absolutely because krishna loves us so he doesn't allow us to go through anything without there being good reason so try to understand what are you trying to teach me and also our challenges are due to behaviors we've done in previous lives so therefore we should also have some compassion for the other person and for ourselves it's like okay so that means that i must have been like this in a previous life okay it, i'm not going to beat myself up about it it's a previous life we, we all make mistakes but it doesn't matter i'm not that person anymore let me deal with it and the other thing and this is i, I, I might do a seminar on this in the future the other thing is if you look carefully you'll see in your own life some repeated patterns for some of us you always wherever you go you, you tend to come across a certain type of person right and what krishna is showing you is this is a karmic pattern and then you can think okay if I, if if in this life i always have to come across people who are very strong and domineering then then okay that means i have to become strong myself so that they don't push me or push me around good so that's the lesson you see so you can also try to understand if i keep having this pattern in my life what does it mean i have to do about myself so i can deal with this karma that i have to sometimes deal with you can do this it is really powerful so i was speaking to one devotee recently and they saw that in their life they keep coming across people who are crafty you see who are very kind of um manipulative and they realized that the way that what krishna was showing them is yes you've got karma where you keep coming across people who are a bit crafty therefore in this lifetime you have to make sure that you that you're that you do things wisely that you act intelligently and that you're not sentimental and they saw that as long as they're wise intelligent and not sentimental even though they come across crafty people nothing happens nothing bad happens to them but if they ever start becoming sentimental then they get into trouble because they're ignoring the lesson that krishna showed them and they're ignoring the particular battle of kurukshetra the particular karmic challenge that they have to work through in this lifetime in order to reach krishna okay so thank you for that question that was a really good question okay so maybe we i think we should stop there yes prabhu ji thank you so much thank you thank you so much uh, for the wonderful class and nice question and session um, at least one more time i have to listen to uh, your answers again and again to meditate on them um, thank you so much and um, thank you so much namrata mata ji for asking such a beautiful question thank you um, thank you devotees um, i think we can end the call here as uh, it's been uh, more than one and a half hour now so Okay I'm going to ask very quickly to end the call please give us your blessings so we can serve properly and become pleasing to our spiritual masters and shri shri radha and krishna and so we can make progress in spiritual life and we can and that we can serve all all living entities in a much better way please hari krishna thank you so much prabhu ji please give your your blessings also so that we can serve our guru maharaj uh, very nicely thank you so much wonderful um, Mm-hmm. All praise to Shri Prabhupada all praise to His Holiness Chandra Mouli Maharaj and his followers Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Vanchakalpata Rupyascha Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Patidanam Bhavani Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Namaha Shri Mad Bhagavatam ki jai Shri La Prabhupad ki jai Guru Maharaj ki jai Thank you so much Prabhu Thank you stay strong keep building that spiritual strength so that whatever happens you can handle it but do it when you have chance do it build your strength now so you can handle the challenge in the future Yes. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much Prabhu.